welcome everybody. Glad to have you here. Hope everybody is safe and healthy and happy and doing 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 well. If you were here early enough on our while we were chatting before the 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 program started, we had mentioned that NC State has now you know they had had stopped the in-person classes and gone to all online. Now they have, they're sending all the students home from dorms now, they just announced. So not much fun on that front. I'm putting in, in the chat a link that's, if you really don't, haven't gotten your fill of me on September 9th before this meeting at noon. I am going to be doing a kind of a, a new plant or virtual plant walk webinar with the Johnston County Nursery Marketing Association. It's typically done over at the fairgrounds. Of course, this will be virtual, but you know, it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's free. Yeah, free. So it's got some other stuff that goes along with it. It's really geared towards landscape professionals, nurserymen, retail garden centers, and designers and folks like that. But hey, it's free. So feel free to 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 be a part of that as well and you can just you know go from that to my wednesday talk one after the other so let's see i'm going to go ahead and get my screen shared and jump right into it It always worries me when it takes some time to. to there you go. Up. Looks good. All right. So we are going to talk about some plants that can take the heat. You know, really, you can just go outside, see anything grow, and it can probably take the heat because it's been a hot, hot summer for us so far. So what I'm going to talk about is really plants that can take the heat and and also the dry soils. It's, this, is, this is a little bit, crosses that line between, you know, plants that like it hot and plants that are drought tolerant. And then you don't have to look like a desert when you have a, a garden that, that can really do this. Before I get started, a couple of things that Chris mentioned. Coming up, our Gardening in the South program. We usually only open this program to new gardeners or people who have just moved into the area. So, but since we're doing it online, we're not constrained by the amount of room, you know, now amount of seats in our auditorium. So we're opening up to anybody. It does require registration to, to join us, but it's September 19th from nine to 12. If you haven't, if you haven't experienced the program with Bryce Lane yet, you are missing out on one of the great horticultural communicators. And Basil Camus with Leaf and Limb, they're really, they are doing some really interesting, innovative stuff with trees. They are really passionate about what trees can, can do for, for our lives and for our world. And so, they're going to give you, you know, it was going to be top 10 tips for happy, healthy, happy trees, but he couldn't, he's, he's one of those people who has so much to say, he couldn't, couldn't cut it down to 10. So top 12 tips. I think that'll really be, be excellent. And also a little bit farther out, but want to put it on your calendar. November 14th, we're going to have our fall symposium and we have got great speakers. Dan Benarsik is a, the, a horticulturist at Chanticleer, which is, they call themselves a pleasure garden. They're not a botanic garden, they're a pleasure garden. They do amazing things with plants. Eileen Boyle from Mount Cuba Center to talk about their, their native plant trials that they're doing at, at Mount Cuba, which is great. Then we have 
the Jim's, Jim Harbage and Jim Sutton from Longwood Gardens, and they're going to talk about their blockbuster floral displays, especially their fall mums. And wow, they do some wild stuff with that. And to, they're going to kind of give a peek behind the curtain at what it takes to put the, that on. And it is crazy. I mean, what they have to do is just something else. The uh, Jamaica Kincaid, who is a garden writer and professor of African and African American studies at Harvard, uh, she wrote a, a column in the um, the New Yorker for quite a while. She is she's wonderful, and then Jason Reeves, who does a lot of work with upcycled upcycled art in the garden out at Tennessee. I am really excited about this group. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. This is a pay for program. So you do need to register and, and do need to, to pay for this, but it's pretty exciting. So just wanted to put those out there to get started. So, you know, we really, we really like to, to test plants out in, in hard conditions out here. So we do a lot of looking for plants that will really t tolerate, you know, the high heat that we have, you know, the often low rainfall over the summer, although this summer has been pretty, pretty nice so far in terms of rain at least, but boy, it's been hot. And, you know, a lot of what people think about are these, you know, cactus and yuccas and things like that, and I will talk about some of those, but I'm also going to talk about plants for the shade garden that that do very well when we hit those high temperatures and, and drier soils. You know, as well as trees and perennials. And so we're going to kind of hit all over the place with this. You know, of course, agaves are, you know, one of those plants that we all think of when we start thinking about plants that take a uh, high heat, a lot of times people only think of them as, you know, desert plants, you know, in the, in Mexico and Texas maybe, but, you know, the fact is many of them grow up into Colorado in the mountains. So there are some very, very cold hardy agaves. There are also some tropical agaves. So they, they stretch across, they can all take heat, but we also need the ones that'll take the cold. Agave Proto-Americana is one of the biggest of the big. At one garden I was at, we had one flower. The plant, before it flowered, was we had measured it. It was just a hair under 14 feet from the ground to the, the top of the most upright spine. And it was about just right a little over 17 feet from spine to spine at its widest part. So they are big plants. And as long as you can pro provide fairly good drainage, they really love it here. They grow much faster in our climate than they do in the Southwest. And then when it flowers, it sends up a flower stalk, you know, 25, 30 feet tall with, with showy yellow flowers. Really pretty amazing. You know, not everybody has room for an agave quite that big, and there are other ones like agave perii, which is a great one that has that same silvery foliage and, and those black tips on there. Depending on your plant, some of them offset quite a lot, and you can get these, take these pups, and you can divide them and plant them in other areas. Some of them don't, don't put offsets nearly as much. But they're all really beautiful plants. And really what you want to look for is how much does it offset? How much, how big does it get? And how cold hardy is it? Because they can be different. So this agave salmiana, you can see where agave perii, it, if it offsets, it offsets right next to it. Agave salmiana with these beautiful kind of curved leaves. You see where its pups are coming up, you know, two, three, four feet away 
So, you know, sometimes when you're gardening, you need to take that into consideration when you're, when you're tracking these, these down. And they don't all have to go, you know, in the ground. They're great in containers. I really love these drought tolerant plants in containers because you don't have to water them every day. And I hate watering plants in pots. It's one of my least favorite chores in my garden. So I, I like to use these, these plants like that. And, you know, isn't that dramatic with those three agaves in those pots? The other ones are yuccas. And yuccas again, you know, they're down in the south, southwest in Mexico, but they come all the way across the southern United States and are native here in North Carolina, a, a few species. So they do very well. I like these ones that, you know, aren't just green, but like this blue one, this blue century that's got that, that great silvery blue color on there. And, you know, these are planted here in our, our xeric garden, our dry garden, but these and the agaves, if your soil is pretty well draining, are great just planted with other perennials. I've got an agave, a, a nice blue agave planted right by, at my house, planted right by a, a gold foliage gardenia. And, you know, it does great. They both kind of thrive there together. You know, this in Vargas, which is sold as Margarita Bill. You can see the, you know, the, the paler green centers. It's got kind of a, a pale green center with kind of yellow margin and then darker green. So you can get some really nice color on those as well. And then the more tree type uh, yuccas are, you know, pretty dramatic. This yucca torii is uh, sometimes called Don Quixote's Lance. And these, whereas these yuccas are both, well, this one's very pretty soft foliage. This one's a little bit stiffer. This thing, you could go hunt boar with one of these leaves. They are vicious. So you don't want to plant this, something like this, where these fronds are going to be, come out and be at eye level for people walking by you need to give people some protection. But when it flowers, it puts this spike of just drop dead gorgeous flowers that comes out of it. I think at one point, Chris kind of manages our photo collection. And I think he put the ultimatum out. No more pictures of yucca torii and flower. We've got, you know, 250 of them. We don't, we don't need any more pictures but it's it's hard to resist taking a picture of it when, whenever you see it in flower. And in a fairly rich soil, it takes surprisingly little time to actually get a trunk on there. If you have rich but well-draining soils from just a small plant, say a gallon-sized plant, within four or five years, you'll really start getting a trunk and within you know, six or eight years, you know, something like this is definitely, definitely possible, which I like. You don't have to wait forever for it. And perhaps my favorite of the trunked yuccas is yucca restrata. It's not quite as tall and big and gnarly as the, the, the yucca torii, it's a little bit softer, more like that blue century. You know, it'll poke you, but you gotta, you gotta, you know, really hit those, that, that foliage head on to, to get it to poke you. You can clean off the trunk or leave it like this. I actually like it like this, but it starts life as a young plant, more as like a little blue globe in the ground. And I just think it's a great one for mixing into other other borders. I, wouldn't this be great if it were moved a little bit over here and this pink Lespedeza was kind of cascading around the trunk there and then you had this blue globe sitting there. I mean what great color combination and, and form and texture. 
be, be amazing. But it's another great one for growing in containers, especially when it's young. You know, you grow it like this, and then once it starts trunking up, you can take it out of the container and plant it in the garden somewhere. There are other similar plants that you find throughout the, the Southwest. The Dazzlerians are, are often very similar. They give great architecture in the garden. And Nolinas, and you can see here, and this is in our perennial border, uh, and you can see it's grown with mums and with other plants around there. It's, it's just your typical average garden soil that we have this growing in. And it just, it, it's the, the texture and since they're evergreen, they give you something in winter when these die down. I use a lot of, of these Dazzlerians, some yucca. Actually, I take it back. I don't use a whole lot of yucca. The Dazzlerians, a few Nolina, some agave in my garden. And I like a lush feeling garden. I don't like, you know, this you know, like dry look at all. So I plant them with my other plants and, you know, let vines clamber through them, let perennials, you know, grow up around them. And I really, I really like them. You got to keep, if you plant them small, you got to keep the other plants from overgrowing them and shading them for a little bit. But once they get a little bit of size like this, they can really hold their own. And I just, I just think they're amazing like that. You know, picture that, that Nolina there with a, with, you know, a soft pink clematis kind of scrambling through there and, and flowering on there. I think it'd be, be really beautiful. Another relative, Bechernaria yucoides. This is a little less hardy. It needs some protection probably. And, and in a cold winter, you could lose it but it's pretty amazing when it flowers. And it looks like all these other plants that are stiff and spiny, except for it's very soft. It won't, this is not one that will draw blood, even, even really if you hit the tips of those leaves. So a little bit kinder and gentler, probably better for, you know, more closer to the coast than here in Raleigh. Although it would have been fine over the last couple of years. But, you know, like I said, even in winter, you know, you've, we've got deciduous shrubs here. All the perennials are, are gone. And even in the snow, this is that Nolina that I showed, you know, that had the mums right here, the yellow mums. And, you know, it's doing just fine out here in the winter. And it gives you something besides bare stems and, and you know, bare ground over the winter. So I do like using them all for that that purpose. But now we're going to move out of those, as we call them, woody lilies and, and move into some other groups. Conifers are often good, you know, but not all of them like our high temperatures. They cause us a lot of fungal problems for a lot of, of conifers. So we're going to talk about a few that do especially well. People love the pines with this, what they call dragon eye type variegation, where it's bands of yellow on the needles. And, you know, if you look down here at this bottom one, it looks like uh, if you're old enough to uh, have had a, a record player, it looks like those things you could cut out of the back of a magazine, you know, and put on there and would spin around and hypnotize you. It, it's just, it's a great plant, but not all of the dragon eye pines really thrive in, in our um, hot conditions. And the one that I've found to be the best is this Pinus Beni Kujaka. Actually, that should be Kujaku with a U there. I thought I had changed that. Beni Kujaku is, means red peacock in, in Japanese. And Pinus densiflora is is a is considered the Japanese red plant pine, but this one is has one of the best colors in there. Some of the dragon's eye pine don't show the color the the yellow as well, but also really takes the heat um, quite well. I think it's it's a favorite. And Pinus leucodermis. This is called the Bosnian pine, and Bosnia in the summer can be quite hot, and this is one that looks a lot like the alpine pines and can grow up 
it does grow naturally up in very high elevations, but really seems to like our heat. It's one of those pines, I really like it as a young plant. When it starts to get big and have a trunk and start losing its lower limbs, I don't find it quite as attractive, but it'll stay pretty nice pyramidal shaped for a pretty long time before it starts to get more irregular. And I really, really like it at, at those stages. And, and you can always get rid of it after that. If you have a little pine and you want to keep it smaller and the new growth comes out, you know how the new growth on a pine comes out in like a tight, tight little, almost like a finger, they call them candles. If you cut that in half when it's, you know, kind of fully emerged, just cut that in half, it'll keep the, your, your plant much tighter and denser and, and cause it to branch in those areas the, the following year. And uh, you can get, keep a much tighter, denser plant that way. I don't do that. It's a lot of work, but I know other people who do that. Um, it's called candling your, your, your pine. Another great one is this Pinus pumila. Pumila means small. Pinus pumila can be pretty darn big. But this is a cultivar called Oliver, which has this really nice bluish foliage. Tends to be more irregular shaped than, you know, upright, like you get with so many other pines. And it is, it's one that really, again, takes the heat and drought very well over the summers. Kind of surprisingly well, because it's, it, you wouldn't think this. But I've often found that the more dwarf conifers do better than the large growing ones in our, in our climate. Now, the Cupressus arizonicas, these, these are the, the true cypresses, and they're, they range, you know, from Colorado on all the way down through into to Mexico and places like that, usually growing in very dry, rocky spots. You know, if you go to Denver during the winter, you'd think it, would, it never gets cold because it is freezing there up in Denver and above there. But in the summers, it can just get brutally, brutally, oppressively hot. And these just do fine. Sapphire Skies is one I really like. Got a really nice silvery blue foliage. Ultimately, it'll get, you know, the, it'll start losing some lower limbs and, and become less of a, a screen type plant and, and become more of a tree. The, there's a gold one, a uh, yellowy green one called Limelight that's really nice as well. I like them both. One thing you have to remember about these plants though is, and a lot of people have planted these cypresses out as, as hedges and screens and things like that because they grow relatively quickly. They're, you know, they're, they're, easy, they're drought tolerant. So once they're established, you don't have to worry about watering them and all that. But where they grow naturally, they they are rooting into you know, rocky hillsides and things like that. So they're really locking themselves into the soil with their roots, into those rocks. They go into the crevices and they hold on. And they can be up there on the mountains and take all kinds of wind and everything. When you plant them out in a row as as a screen and they are, their roots are going all through, whether it's your nice garden soil or our heavy clay and they're doing fine, they're doing fine. They, they get bigger and bigger and they become a real windbreak. And as a windbreak, when they're not holding on to, you know, really gripping into the, the rock, that's there, but are growing kind of shallowly over our clay or through our, you know, your nice garden soil if you've done a lot of amending. As they get big and they start blowing and they get wet and they're blowing in, you know, a, a storm, they'll have a tendency to kind of pull over because their roots don't really grip as well in, in soils like, like we have as they do when they can really grow into 
uh, rocky hillsides and mountains. So it's something to be aware of. Usually by the time they, they blow over, you're usually about ready for them to go because they've gotten so big anyway. Sometimes you see people trying to stake them back upright. Sometimes that works, but more often the next big storm, they're just gonna blow over again. Podocarps, these, this is a real, was a real surprise for me. You know, they're fine out in sun and heat and whatever, but in 2007, when we had our 100-year drought, the Podocarpus macrophyllus, which grow as understory trees mostly in China, were one of the plants that just sailed through with no problem. We were growing quite a few. We had them up by our parking lot where they never got water, where it was hot, and wow, they did great. This is a form that we found down in University of Georgia. We were down there, and I was down there giving a talk. They have a big kind of urban forestry conference, and I was giving a talk on new trees. And it was, I was riding around. And I saw these in a field on campus. And I was like, what are those? And um, they tracked them down and said, well, nobody really knows what they are. They've been growing there as trial plants and nobody's ever done anything with them. I'm like, they're great. Can I get a bunch of cuttings? And they sent me up a bunch of cuttings. And I said, we got to name this thing. And so I wanted to name it Gator Fang because it was down at University of, Georgia, of Florida. They didn't like that, so they named it, they wanted to go with Sunshine Spire, which great, that's fine. We're still growing them out. I know we distributed a bunch of them, but I think that has the potential to be a great plant and just completely drought tolerant. And so after that 2007, when we saw how well the podocarps, especially macrophyllus, did, we we started collecting them. Oh, I got an old name on here too. That should be Akame, A K A M E although it's being sold often as Royal Flush and maybe it's got another name as well. But this is one that flushes out with red new growth if it's in sun. In shade, it's not nearly as red. All right, gonna move off to conifers. We'll come back to some trees and shrubs, but get into the perennials because we all have more room for perennials than anything else, right? So a plant that's great for high heat, dry soils, full sun, the, the agastaches. The agastaches actually, you, they need to be in well-drained soil if you get a lot of rain like we do in the East Coast. They, they don't, they will suffer if they get too much uh, rain. And some of them can be kind of finicky, but the best ones are just amazing plants. This Toronjil Morado, I, I, I don't speak Spanish, so is one that's always really impressed me. It's pretty tall. It's about four feet tall and just starts flowering, you know, early summer and just keeps going and going and going for a long period. Hummingbirds love it. Butterflies love it. It's, it's a really good plant. Kind of the, a different type, more the, like what, Blue Fortune was a really popular Agastache. This is one that's a little bit smaller called Blue Boa that I found to be an even better flowering plant. Now, Agastaches tend not to be long lived. So, you know, you give them their um, four, five, eight years in the garden and they'll, they'll grow and spread and do better. And then, you know, maybe have a really wet year and they wet winter or something and they kind of dwindle down a little bit and that's okay. You just replace them with something else or or replant them and they'll do they'll do fine. They're they're all whether you get these these ones like blue boa and blue fortune, they're great pollinator plants. They just are covered with bees when they're in flower and they flower over a really, really long um, period. Of course, we know our native butterfly weed. Such a great, great plant. So easy once it gets established. 
tell you this, never, you can buy a lot of perennials when in, you know, early spring when nothing's showing in the pot. Never buy a butterfly weed without seeing something growing in the, in a pot. They just, they're notorious for rotting out in containers and most good growers won't sell their plants until you start seeing some leaves emerging. And once you see even those little green tips emerging, you're fine then, but you don't want to take home an empty pot. These are great. I love seeing them in the wild when I'm, you know, driving or hiking and you see an open field and they have these. And of course, they're the the hosts for monarch butterflies. So any of the Asclepius are, are great hosts. The butterflies will go to them for nectar and their, their caterpillars will eat the leaves. So it's great for that. The more you have, the more monarch butterflies you're going to attract to your, to your garden. You just have to be okay with caterpillars eating some of the leaves of your plants. That's, that's all part of the process. It, it's, and it's okay. The plants are, are designed to withstand, be able to withstand that. And they'll eat every leaf off of the thing and you'll think they've killed it. And it'll, it'll reflush out with, with new foliage and, and stems and be, and be just fine. So don't, don't worry too much about that. Another, another native, North American native, Calaroe. Calaroe involucrata is a great native perennial. It's what I really like about it is you've got your plant, it's planted as a crown. Now this looks like it's spread all over the place, right? But it hasn't really, it just puts out these kind of long creeping stems that kind of creep along the ground that can be, you know, they can wind up being, uh, you know, six feet wide. But then in the winter, they'll go back to you know, a single crown. So you cut all that back. So these are just weaving through your other plants, not smothering them. This variety, Tenuis secta, is a paler color. Usually, if you like a little more garish, Calaroe involucrata is, is kind of a brighter, brighter color, although there's a white one called Logan Calhoun. But this variety, Tenuis secta, has these pale yellow flowers with white centers and these very much dissected leaves. The regular involucrata is not nearly as dissected as this. There's, there's a full leaf right there you can kind of see. They are, they're great because they just, they kind of cover up space between when other plants are doing their thing. So they flower for a long period, but even when they're out of flower, they've kind of covered the ground and help keep weed seeds from germinating and things like that. And especially with things that, that don't flower or come emerge until a little later, like some perennials do. These are great for having something covering up that spot earlier in the season. And if they get, they grow too wide, you just go in there and, and cut them back a little bit and they don't mind that at all. That'll just kind of kick them into gear to gar start growing again and flowering again. Another Southwestern plant, Scutellaria sofrutescens, Texas rose. This has been, you know, a highly, highly regarded garden plant for the past 20 years. And it is a plant that I just, if I have enough sun for it, I will have it in my garden. Scutellaria is a little, is called skull cap because of the flowers, although I'm not quite sure they're I don't know, know why they, people think they look like skull caps. There's a lot of scutellarias, and a lot of them are very, very nice. I've been growing one that was new to me this year. I just learned about it. Scutellaria melichampii, which is named for, I think, the great grand or the grandfather of Larry Melichamp, if you know him. He was the, he was the professor in at UNC Charlotte and has written several books, especially about native plants and really a native plant guru, but it has blue flowers and it's just been flowering and flowering. 
But this Texas rose stays nice and low uh, over time. It can form a nice little patch, you know, two, maybe three feet wide and will flower, just cover itself in these uh, pink flowers. That's such a really nice little plant. Nepetas, another group that's great. Most of what's coming out, they keep trying to get them lower and lower and lower. There's, you know, there was Walker's Low and then there was, you know, Walker's Low Junior and Little Walker Low Junior. I, I don't know what they are, but, and, and those are fine, but I like the, the taller ones. So these are cat mints. And so Joanna Reed is a really good one. Best in a bit of a lean soil for these taller ones because sometimes they'll split open if they're in too rich of a soil. But when they flower, just the, the insects love them. They just cover this. My neighbor has beehives and he comes over to my, my garden. He says, you know, I don't know why my bees are always over here in your garden. I'm like, well, because I have plants like this and you don't. You have a bunch of green meatballs and they don't do much for the, the, the pollinators. Um, but I'm really, really fond of this Joanna Reed. I think it's a, an exceptional plant. And then when it's, you know, they'll flower for a really long time, but when it's kind of going past, when it doesn't look really pretty anymore, I just come in and grab handfuls of it and cut all the way back, back into the green. I don't worry about if I'm cutting off new flowers or anything like that. It'll produce more if you do that. There's just too many to snip them out singly unless you have way more time on your hands than me but I'll cut it all down so it's just, so it's a little green meatball again, and it'll start flowering again within, within weeks. The red hot pokers, I love red hot pokers. I love the, what they're doing with them now are just amazing. The popsicle series from Terra Nova is great. Mango, pineapple, whatever, pops, uh, popsicle. I love this one, Sunningdale. Yellow is just, I love these colors that are just super saturated. And they flower and flower and flower. For me, and typically for me, what I'll get as I'll get with most of them, I'll get one really good show of flowers like this. I'll come in as they start looking ugly and I'll cut off the flowers. Cut them, just go to them, boom, 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 down to the, the base. And then it'll send out more flowers tends to be a little bit more sporadic uh, after that not a, that big flush but they'll keep putting out flowers over a long period if you do cut out the old stems you know spanish gold this is the more typical colors of the red hot poker except they have these great red stems on there Ooh, i like that amongst the green just like that whole look on there And sages, of course, are great plants for sun and drought. I may have talked about this. I most likely have on previous midweeks with Mark. But for those of you who weren't with me, the Salvia New Yar is a selection, a hybrid from Israel. And what this is, is a hybrid between culinary sage, Salvia officinalis, which likes cold weather, but isn't so crazy about our really hot weather. It just tends to kind of, you know, sit in our hot weather and is better as in, in cool weather. And Salvia fruticosa, which is a very, very heat tolerant form, but not very cold tolerant. So they combine those two and both of those can be used for culinary purposes. Both of those uh, you know, you can use them as, as sage. Well, they combined them and what they got was a plant that is more vigorous, much more vigorous than either of the parents. One that flowers completely, so much showier than either of the parents, is heat tolerant, is cold tolerant. And if you, if you harvest the leaves and dry them like you would with other sage, it actually has more, uh, more, potent sage flavor than the the true salvia officinalis the culinary sage so it is really a great plant and if you look real closely you can see it even has little even attracts little lizards there's a little anole on there on the leaf 
but no, it's a, it's a really, really good plant, I think. It will kind of spread and spread by underground stems, so you get a bigger and bigger patch. You just pull it up anywhere you don't want it and give it to a friend. They'll appreciate it. Just really fine plant. The, the salvia gregii is another good plant. There are salvia gregii eyes in just about any color you want. I like this desert blaze because even when it isn't flowering, it's got variegated foliage, which is nice. But you get reds and whites and, you know, pastel purples and kind of dark burgundies and some almost yellows. And just there's a lot of them out there and, and they're all pretty good. And with the salvia gregii tend to be kind of semi evergreen for us. They have woody stems and so tend to, to stay, have some presence during the winter. Baptisias. Uh, what can I say about Baptisias? It had already been said. These are phenomenal plants. They're, they're natives, but what's been, been happening in breeding is just led to some great breakthroughs in these plants. Baptisias, I always joke in my uh, lazy gardener cla class, they're perfect because one, once they're established, you can't kill them. I mean, you really can't kill them. They are tough. And two, if you just leave them alone at the end of the, at the end of the growing season, they kind of turn gray, maybe brown and everything else in the garden, you know, you have to cut back. They will turn, turn brown and they will, all the stems will abscise uh, at the bottom that will just naturally detach and they'll kind of blow away like tumbleweeds and you can just let them blow into your neighbor's garden. So perfect for lazy gardening. This is maybe my favorite right now, lemon meringue. You know, they, they come in whites, yellows, blues, some, some burgundy colors, some, some, even some chocolatey colors. But in terms of just a show in the garden, I think this is, has been my favorite in recent years. It just, it's so many flowers. They sit above the foliage. Really, really good plants. And, but there are a lot out there. And here's the thing with people who have never grown a Baptisia. If you go to your garden center and you go look at your Bapti the Baptisias they have, you're going to see like a gallon plant or a quart plant, and it's going to have one or two little stalks in it. And you are going to say, I am not going to pay for that. There is no reason. It's, there's nothing there. They, they always look ugly in a pot, always, in a, in a growing container. Take it home, put it in the ground. They establish very, very easily, and they will grow. And every year, they will be better, every single year. And if you ever have to move one that's established like this one, plan on having a second shovel because they are there for life and you may have to break a shovel to get it out. Just, so they're, they're some, one of the best perennials. And you know, if they you grow them in a place that's shady, they will still grow. They won't flower quite as heavily, but, they, but in like light shade, they do just fine. In heavy shade, they, they look spindly and won't bulk up as quick and are best in sun. But yeah, you can, you can grow them kind of anywhere. Love Baptisias. The other one's Baptisias ferricarpa. This is screaming yellow, a really bright yellow <laughs> one. I don't have pictures of the blue ones, I guess. I thought I did. I wonder if I saved the wrong version of this. Doesn't matter. Just think the same thing in pale blue or lavender or a nice royal blue. There are some other species out there that are really neat. Baptisia perfoliata is one with yellow flowers, but it's not very showy because the flowers, you see these, these are flower buds and the flowers are, you'll have flowers in each of the leaf axles, not those terminal spikes like the other ones. But look at the foliage. I mean, it looks like you're growing a bushy uh, eucalyptus in your garden and it's silvery blue. So great for kind of the providing some you know, textural and color contrast. And it just makes this nice, perfect mound of, of great foliage. 
and another one from the foliage for foliage. This is a, a Georgia native plant. Again, not quite as showy as some of the other ones in flower, although it is nice yellow <laughs> flowers, but it's called Baptisia arachnifera, and it's got these these leaves that have these white hairs over it. The stems are covered in white hairs. The flower buds are covered in white hairs. Just a really showy little plant. Now, you're not going to be able to get this through mail order unless you get it from somebody in North Carolina, like Plant Delights Nursery, because it's federally endangered, and so it can't be shipped across state lines. You can go, you can drive and pick it up and bring it home, but they can't mail it across state lines unless they have a, a, a specific permit for that. But gorgeous little plant. And these, like I said, you get them, it's one or two little spindly stems, plant it. The next year it'll, it'll have, you know, double the amount of stems. It'll have some good flowers. The year after that, it's going to be this really full, nice plant. The year after that, it is a showpiece in the garden. I'll move into more shade. You know, some of these plants are great for hot, for dry. You know, this Aspidistra, you know, all the Aspidistra, Aspidistra aladiers are great house plants. They're some of the few house plants that I manage to keep alive because I don't like to water and these can thrive on neglect. Asahi is one that's got this uh, almost brush strength streak of white down from the tip of each leaf. There's one that has even more white called snow cap, which is really beautiful, but I actually like Asahi more. I think it's a little more of a delicate thing. And these will bulk up year after year for them, unless we have a very cold winter, they, they stay evergreen. It's, you know, the common name is cast iron plant because they're so tough, but they're great for giving you that upright kind of vertical accent in the garden. A lily of the valley, another one, you know, you can plant these right around the bases of like oak trees and things like that that suck up a lot of water. They seem to do fine in situations like that and make a, a really nice ground cover. Striata is one that has these stripes on the leaf. If you're looking for, for that kind of, this kind of look, you're probably the better one is one called Potsdam stripe, which just has the stripes last longer and are more uniform on the plants, but they have the great fragrant flowers. Just super. I, I love them. I grow a lot of different lily of the valleys. Some people don't like them because over time they can really form dense ground covers and they spread and, you know, I like you just need to put them in the right place, you know, spots where other things don't want to grow they do great. And if they grow somewhere you don't want them, you just dig them up and, you know, give them to friends. I love sharing plants with friends. Then, you know, if, if they're a great gardener, they'll give you plants back. And if they're not a great gardener, then after you've given them a bunch of plants, you can ask them to help you move or you can borrow their pickup truck or whatever. That's, that's how I get things done is sharing plants. Epimediums, another group that is great for you know, our, our hot climates and, and dry summers, they, they can really do well with that. I like these ones that have great foliage in the spring. Some of them, some new epimediums come out with really dark foliage, like this dark beauty. Some have maroon speckling all over the leaves. I, I, I really like that because you get that and then it flowers this is dark beauty a little bit later, you know, there's, there's still, excuse me, a little bit earlier, it comes out and, you know, new growth still coming out. That's that dark, but then it's got, you know, all the flowers on there. So you get kind of multiple effects from the plant. So that's, this is it later in the summer when it's just flushing out new growth. You can see it's just finishing flower there. I mean, this is it earlier in the spring. I, I just I just love that. And there are so many epimediums now. There are epimediums that'll grow three feet tall and ones that'll grow two inches tall and one that have masses and masses of tiny flowers and ones that have many fewer but much larger flowers. 
in bi colors like like this, the white and lavender. There are ones that are yellow and orange and really nice pinks and and bi colors. It's just all kinds of things out there. It's a it's a wide wide open group. One of my this is one of my absolute favorite plants, and I know people hear me say that a lot, but it really, really is Ardesia japonica. This is a plant that once it's established, it will grow in tough spots. This is a, bit, a trunk of a very big evergreen oak. So it's in deep shade and it's in very, very dry soil that nothing else wants to grow in. And look at the ground cover it's become growing under there. It just keeps spreading. Now, it would be even denser and more beautiful if it wasn't in such a tough, tough spot, but it takes it in that, that hot, dry area. And so it's a great plant. And then there are all kinds of selections of it. Here at the Arboretum, we have over 40 different, a lot of them are still in our nursery. They're just, you know, they're very young plants. And you know, the, the most vigorous ones are great for growing as a ground cover. Maybe the hardiest one is this shiramen, which is a small leaf, low one that is, that is really great, fills in quickly, only grows about four inches tall as compared to this is you know, six or so inches tall. Flowers are not real showy. They're kind of pink flowers under the leaves. And then it has, it'll form bright red berries. There's some berries here that are just starting. But again, since it flowers under the leaves, the fruit are kind of under the leaves as well. They are hardy, but in a cold winter, it can burn the tops off and then it'll have to, to re-sprout. In, in Japan, even though these are ground covering plants, they will grow these really odd ones in small pots called, and they call it koten enge is, is the culture of these, these specific plants. And there's a group of traditional plants that are grown this way in Japan, the Ardesia being one of those. And we are, we are gonna be doing a program on koten enge in December. So keep an eye out on that. It should be a lot of fun. But these are just a few of the different kinds that you can, you can find. You know, something else like Ardesia that you can grow in really rough spots are Iris reticulata, the, our little um, reticulate irises. And they do, they do very well like that, as long as they're getting some light, but in these dry, tough spots, they do great. I'm going to zip through a few trees. Our native black gums, Nyssa sylvatica, fantastic. In, in tough spots. They grow naturally both in very dry soils and you know almost boggy low uh, bottomland uh, woodland soils and, and they're really beautiful trees. You get red fall color or this orange or sometimes kind of purple. You know it's you can really get something great. There's some fantastic cultivars out there like Wildfire is probably the most widely grown one. I think there are better ones like Heyman's Red and, and, and other ones, but they're, they're, all, they're all pretty good. Green Gable is a really nice, really even-headed one. Another severely underutilized native plant. This is another one that grows from kind of almost wetland conditions to very, very dry sandy soils. Cirilla racemiflora, it grows kind of as a, a large shrub or small tree. During the summer when it flowers, it is one of the best pollinator plants you'll be, ever be able to find. And then in the winter, fall and in, in winter, it's kind of semi-evergreen, but it will turn bright, bright red like this. And this is a picture I think taken in late December. So you can see it's still got green leaves on there and it's really the older leaves that are going to fall off anyway that are turning this bright red. But I think it is one of the truly, truly, unfortunately, undersung plants, uh, native plants that, that we have. Myricas, Myrica serifera, the 
or Morella serifera, our southern bayberry is a great one. This is Soleil, selected here in North Carolina, which has gold foliage, but another one that will grow basically anywhere. They are tough as nails and you can, you can plant it anywhere. In sun, especially for this Soleil, you get the best color for it, but they do get big. You can shear them, you can trim them into hedges, you can you know, carve them into animal shapes if you like. They're really amenable to all of that. So you can keep it smaller. You don't have to let it get way too big. Osmanthus, can't talk, give a talk without talking about Osmanthus. Osmanthus fortunii is a hybrid Osmanthus. Not quite as, as fragrant as I, Osmanthus fragrance, but still very fragrant and really one of the most be more beautiful ones in flower. And it's also really what I consider one of the very toughest in terms of, of drought tolerance and heat. They get to be big plants. You know, it takes a little while for them to really get going, but they're great. And then the Chinese fringe trees, again, this, I, this always goes in talks where I talk about tough plants. It's, it is one of the toughest of all flowering trees, the Chinese fringe tree, Chinanthus. Retusis. We have a native one, which is beautiful, which is great. It's not as tough and doesn't quite give the same look when it's in flower, but that's gorgeous. Fall color, you can sometimes get a little of yellowing on there, but I wouldn't say much about that fall color except for the way it backlights that those fruits. It's pretty nice. Kyanthus are male or female for the most part, they're dioecious. So you need a female to get the fruits. So the males though tend to be a showier in flower, but the females will give you that extra season of show with the, those bluish fruits on there. Speaking of fruit, Acaceloiana, the pineapple guava, another incredibly easy, tough plant. It's got beautiful evergreen foliage and then these great flowers, the pink petals and the red stamens. If you live with, in a place with a little bit longer season than we have here, you'll get fruit that is delicious. It, it tastes like tropical fruit. I, you know, people say it tastes like a cross between banana and strawberry, and they seem to say that about every tropical fruit, and they don't. They taste like something tropical. But even where you, we, for us who can't get the fruit, you can eat the flower petals are really, really sweet and tasty. So that's cool. Love, uh, this is, this is another plant that I, basically never garden personally without. I just love it, love it, love it so much. I think it's a spectacular plant. And another great plant for fruit is the Japanese persimmon, Dospus keki, which does not get so big as, uh, as our native persimmon. The fruits are larger, especially if you get a named variety like Fuyu, and there's a lot of named varieties, and some of them don't need that freeze before becoming sweet. Some are never astringent. Others are very astringent, and you need to wait until they get that freeze to really get good. Most of the Japanese persimmons tend to be, at least the ones we get in the U.S., tend to be a little bit firmer fleshed than our native persimmons, but in Japan, there are a lot of varieties that are very soft, like our, our native persimmons. But the, these are more, you know, like eating an apple than our native ones are. Fuyu is the most widely available one. The other great thing about it is it's not a huge tree like our native one, and it gets great fall color. I mean, look at that. Isn't that, that's, you, people should be growing this plant just for fall color. You know, the fruit's just a, an added bonus. Really, really neat plants. One other fruiting plant, and one that we often don't get fruits on, is the loquat, Iriobotria japonica. 
we've we have one we call Ralston Hardy. That's that we got in Taiwan. It's a big evergreen plant, bold foliage, kind of the best forms are kind of silvery blue, especially with the newest foliage. And then it flowers, starts flowering with very fragrant flowers in the winter. And then it will have fruit by in, in the spring. The problem is often we'll have one or two freezes that are just a little bit too cold and will kill the, the flowers on there. But the flowers are really showy during the winter. And it, it's, it's worth it even if you don't get the fruits. But the fruits are delicious if you do get them. One viburnum, this is, this is the one when we just released another plant called Ralston Hardy because it's hardy. This is a dwarf form of our south, southeastern native Walter's viburnum, viburnum obovatum. This is, this is another plant that came to our attention after the, the 2007 drought. It was, the viburnums were very, very poor, badly affected by the drought. But this dwarf form, uh, this Viburnum obovatum, this species, uh, really sailed through without a problem, probably because it's native to South Georgia and Florida, but is also perfectly hardy. And we we wound up naming this one this one variety and, and distributing it. So if you drive by the the landscape renovation of the D H Hill Library on Hillsboro. They've planted these out in in mass out in front of the, the building. So and UNC campus has those a lot as well. So they've got a couple thousand Ralston Hardy on the UNC Chapel Hill campus. I like that. Arbutus, this is a Mediterranean plant and you can probably see how it's related to blueberries and Pieris and plants like that. It's an evergreen arbutus. It, it has flowers and then it takes it a full year to develop fruit. So you'll get fruit and flowers at the same time on the plant. I really love it. It's, it's hard to find plants to purchase. I like the dwarf ones like Elven, Elfin King and Compacta just because of size constraints and that kind of thing. But it is just think a beautiful little plant with that dark, dark, glossy foliage, the flowers, and then those bright fruits. But you don't see it offered very often. You got to kind of go to specialty places to get it. We all know butterfly bush are tough as nails, right? They, they can take the hot and dry. I love this bright gold one called Evil Ways with that kind of garish flower with it. I like tacky. Put that in your, your hot border. I just love that. I think that's great. But, but, you know, all the butterfly bush are really good. If you don't have a lot of space, the, the, you know, the ones that were released by Denny Werner and the Arboretum, like blue chip and ice chip and blue microchip are all great dwarf ones. Also, there's another series called Pugster, which has really big flower panicles on really compact plants is a great one. So I'm going to end there, a reminder about gardening in the south, September 19th, go ahead and register. We do, we can let a lot of people in this, but there is a limit to how many we can, our, our technology will allow us to have. So if you think you're interested, make sure you register. If you do register and decide not to come, not to join us, let us know because we, that way we can let more people in. Also, don't forget the, our fall symposium, Falling for Color, on November 14th. You can register for that now. It's online. That, again, there is, that is, there is a cost with this one, but, again, there's a limit to how many people we can take, and I think this is going to be very, very popular, so make sure you register early. And then, again, um, since we always get asked what's on the the plant cart we've got agave potatorum becky 
This is not a terribly hardy one, so you probably want to bring it inside. But the nice thing about it is, unlike some of these really variegated agaves, it will offset. So mostly what you'll be getting are plants that are not offsetting yet. So if you bring it in, have it inside for the, the winter and put it back outside next year, put it in a sunny window, you'll get some offsets. So you can plant one outside in a protected spot and keep one in a container to bring inside. The yellow, the green fruited, yellow fruited Italian golden honey fig. This has, this is one of the first to start producing because it's a really short season fig. It's very hardy. It'll get big and it's showy. And because it doesn't turn brown like other figs, birds don't know they're ripe and won't eat it. Michael Gardenia, this is an old, old selection. And the reason it's still around is because it's one of the best. We've grown it for a long, long time. It looks like your, gard your classic gardenia, but it is a good one. The, the hardy yellow banana, this is a squat little plants, more bushy than the taller stems of typical banana. And at its tip, it has this big, almost lotus-like gold flower, yellow flower that's, gosh, it's like eight or 10 inches or more across. It'll make little little tiny bananas, but there are full of seeds. You don't want that. Pinus inglemanii, a, a Mexican pine that is really neat. It'll grow very tall, really long needles. It is real cool. They can be, you know, almost a foot and a half. A great arborvitae, gold arborvitae that grows you know, moderately to about eight feet in, in 10 years. And then the, the silvery white haired Tratoscantia, this is Tratoscantia silamontana, great as a house plant, great as a garden plant in full sun. You know, once it's established, it's, it's there. You don't have to worry about it over drought or anything. Great plants. Okay. I am going to stop sharing and am happy to answer questions. Looks like there's a lot of activity on there. There was a lot of activity in the chat, Mark. I need to go back and hunt down a question from Rose. I'm hoping people might restate them because there's a whole lot of things that were addressed, but still a lot of them. But okay. you really struck a new a nerve with that Salvia New Year. New Year. It's not and New I, Year. New Year. I, I, don't, oh. I don't pronounce Southern very well. It is. Um, it is it is a no it, it's it's hebrew oh there you go uh, I, thought it was <laughs> I can't remember one of the names is uh refers to where it is the kind of research station where it was developed uh, it's it, so let's see we've given it to a bunch of nurserymen i don't know who's growing it I can only find that Plant Delights had it in the past, but I, I told them that I'll put it in the chat if they want it, because maybe you can tell Mark or Tim to propagate it in the future. Yes, and we have propag propagated it, and we can propagate it again. Forest Oasis is what somebody told me it, it yeah. means. Right. The, and I, we looked it up. It, we got it as under a different name, but we figured it out. Yeah, the banana... Before, the, the, the banana is very hardy. If you have a young plant, you may want to mulch it, uh, especially planting it, you know, late season. If you get the banana off our cart, go ahead and put it in the ground. It'll have plenty of time to grow and it should be just fine. If we're going to have exceptionally cold winter, throw some branches over it or something like that during the cold spell. But otherwise, you should be fine. And you don't, you don't cut it back like other bananas. Leave it up. So Rose was looking for the name of the plant before the Nolina. Was that the Desilirian? That was Desilirian, yes. The compact Budlia that I mentioned, I mentioned several. The ones from the Arboretum are like blue chip and, and there are a bunch of them. They all have chip in the name. But the one that has the big, really big 
flower clusters on a compact plant are in the pugster series. So let me write that pugster. So it's like pugster blue, pugster white, pugster lavender kind of thing. Oh, the plant giveaway. I was supposed to do that up at the beginning. I was going to do that. Here's how the plant giveaway is going to work. And for those who are not members, the giveaway is for members only. The giveaway is always the first Saturday in October. What we're doing is we are propagating a bunch of great plants like we always do. We are going to have our, the members who want to participate are going to have to uh, register. We will put something out there. You'll have to sign up that you're going to, you are going to participate because we need to know how many people are going to be coming that Saturday morning. And we will get everybody what JC used to do when he would visit nurserymen and go places. He would have these grab bags of plants. So everybody will get a grab bag of really great plants from the Arboretum. You won't be able to select what you want. It'll be, it'll be basically random what you get. If you get something you don't want, give it to a friend, trade it around, that kind of thing. But they're all going to be really, really great plants. And we will just, you'll come by, show the thing showing that you had registered to come by or tell us your name and we'll check you off the list of members. And then you'll drive down on, on Barrel Road a little farther and we'll have stations where people will just hand you the, the your, your grab bag of plants. What time? It will, we haven't decided that yet, but likely it'll be, you know, nine o'clock on October the 3rd. October the 3rd in the morning is when it will be. We'll, we will have more information about time as we figure that out. There won't be any mailing plants, anything like that. There's a question about whether leaf mulch will be available despite NC State being open. That The leaf mulch is a joint program between ourselves and the, the horticulture field lab. And so somebody let me know that the city is, has stopped their compost and mulch for the time being, Wake County has. So I sent that on to the people that we partner with in the field lab and we're trying to make a decision, they're trying to make a decision. They do most of the actual, they do the actual loading and everything. So we're seeing, because everybody's shorthanded, does it, does it work for us to do that? So we're, we may, and we will put something out there if we do that, but I'm not sure. Bill asked how much sun does Aka need? I know it likes full sun, but full I don't know how sun. much. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it does shade very well. Okay. You know, we thought about sun and shade grab bags and we just can't. It is, it is just, it's it's too complex when people start being able to make selections in that way. I just don't think it's going to be able to happen. We will we will still put that under advisement, and we'll talk through it as a staff and see if that is possible. It's a lot of work. It, it is. It may. It it just is one more layer of confusion. It's one more layer of during the pickup, having to direct people to different spots and that kind of thing. We will, at some point, we'll have a list of, of included pants in the giveaway. I don't know if that will be, I don't think we'll be able to have it up beforehand. And oh, there's a question about two grab bags for family dual members. That is a great question. And it was something that I was, we were talking about it this this morning in a zoom meeting with staff and that was something that kept running through my head to bring up once we got through and i kept forgetting about it and tomorrow we'll have a staff meeting and chris is going to help me remember that that is going to be um something we'll discuss how that works for for dual member for you know memberships above the the individual level because we will there will be something for that. Yeah. 
and that's something that we'll we'll have to get that information on. There's a good one from Kathy. What's that? A uh, good good question from Kathy. New T-shirt available the new yet? New T-shirt available yet? We um, we don't have a date for the new T-shirt yet. It should be available early September is when it's going to be. And you will, as soon as it's available, we're going to put it out so you can, you can order it. And the t-shirts are going to be all mailed. They're not going to be picked up. So there'll be a, just a, a little surcharge for shipping, but it's going to be basically at our cost for the shipping. And that's one we're, we're just going to, we're going to send it to you. So if you want to buy a shirt for, you know, your friend in Michigan, you know, we can ship it straight to Michigan if you want, you know, or in Western North Carolina. That's good. Will I'm a hundred miles from you. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I mean that's great. So yeah, we can we can get that to you. We yeah. we always let people know when their membership needs to be renewed. If if you get by without knowing that your membership needs to be re renewed, you are blocking our emails and not open up the the mail we mail you because we do make sure we get you both ways because some people like email, some people like, like a letter. So I don't know if there were other questions before that, that Chris hadn't gotten to the Salvia New Year. We, we always try and propagate that some, so we'll make sure we get that propagated and, and available to y'all for sure. I think I got a whole lot of the questions today, Mark, but they certainly were flying fast and furious because <laughs> I don't know if it was the topic today or got a different group of people, but wow, they were fast. Yeah. And prolific. Well, I am glad. If anybody has a question that was not answered, go ahead and retype it in and I'm happy to answer it because, you know, it is a lot of, of things in there and I know Chris can't can't hit them all. Well, there are answer all of them, but um. I did remember one. I didn't remember the um, Sunshire Spire Podocarpus. I could be getting the name wrong. Someone asked what the height was. I gave them the height of the species. Yeah, Sunshine Spire <laughs> is, you know, I like to give in 10 years. In 10 years, you're probably looking at 10 to 12 feet. It, when we get to my last talk that I have scheduled so far, the last September, I'm going to be talking about great trees. And I'll show a picture of a podocarp that is well over whatever, whatever you found in there. You know, that's, that's also 250 years old, but it's, think of a huge oak, you know, it looks like that. So, yeah. Question, any idea when we may be opening again? Well, we hope we're moving in that direction. We have some volunteer groups that have we've been able to bring into the garden to help with the you know weeding that we need to do and getting things ready for people back in because we want people back in you know the university has just made the the um, decision to send everybody out Cape you know someone mentioned Cape Fear Cape Fear is uh, has a much more open kind of plan footprint than than we have it's you know is what it is we're, we're, we would like to be open that is our goal is to be open so we are working as hard as we can to get there where can you get the Ralston Hardy viburnum should be able to get it from local garden centers ask them for it there's a bunch of growers around it's just it's been very very popular and so they run out. So if you put like, you know, if you try and get it this fall, it might be all sold out. But if you talk to a good garden center and say, I want it in spring, you know, put me down to get some. I think most garden centers will, will try and try and help you out with that. Another question about fall color on Nissa. Nissa wildfire has a really nice red fall color. It has been very popular. I think it grows really well in nurseries. 
So it has become one of the more popular ones, one of the easier ones to find. I actually like Red Rage, which is another one that's being grown. It has the reddest, the brightest red, think burning bush kind of red foliage. I think it's great. It's a little bit harder to find sometimes, but wildfire is has consistently good fall color, whereas some other, if you just have seedlings of, of Nissa, they may not have as good a color. Is the viburnum borer susceptible? We have never had borers on it or heard about it in the nursery, so I think it's probably pretty good. <clears throat> Let's see, is there a website to help us choose plants for different conditions? Well, um, you can see what we're growing here online. That, that's helpful. There is an extension website that is, I don't know what it is, but a North Carolina extension website that has good information for the most part. Every once in a while, I have to tell them they've got the picture of a wrong plant up there, but I think that's more usually, you know, a number being transposed and so picture being uploaded than any, anything else. Is Budley Evil Ways sterile? No. There you go, NC Extension Plant Toolbox. Can the Podocarpus Akame take full sun? It will have the best color in full sun. Other questions? And so are all, is the Japanese persimmon fuyu all weeping? No, it's not. If it looked like it was weeping, it was just because of how the plant was being grown. It was kind of getting shaded out. There is a weeping Japanese persimmon. I don't know that it has a cultivar name other than weeping or something like that. It doesn't have great fruit. It has fruit. They're kind of spindle shaped instead of flat. It's a lot of seed. <clears throat> I haven't found it to be the best tasting. But I have two. two. I have two and they're both weeping and they, they have the little round fruits. And I did, you know, silly me, I did everything I could to prop them up and stake them up last summer. And then I realized that was their habit. Oh, I'd be interested to see some pictures of those. If you could, if you want to email me some pictures of them, I'd love to see that. Yeah, because I didn't know. So the fruit, the the uh, the foliage is beautiful. It's glossy and mm -hmm. and dark. And uh, I left the fruit alone this year. Last year I pulled it all off, but this year I left it alone. And it's the little round, little apple shaped fruits. I'll send you some pictures. That would be fantastic. I'm very interested in that because. The, the only the weeping form I know has kind of these very, very different, long, narrow fruits. Yeah. Compared to I don't know what I have fruit. then. Very interesting. I would love to see that. Thank you. This is, this is exciting. Last week, I got, um, somebody has a great plant that we're going to, we're going to graft that came out of, out of the, the meeting. Um, this is fantastic. You know, the only thing I hate is that everybody asks these wonderful questions in chat, questions I probably would have never thought of that I would love to hear the answer to, but I, I can't read the chat and listen to you at the same time. I mean, I don't know the answer for that unless you just had a question and answer afterwards, but I would love to see all the, all the questions and their answers. Right now, you can go to the chat and click on the three little dots and you can save the chat. Okay. All right, because I know these folks are asking questions I wouldn't have even thought of. You have to save the don't chat have... before it closes. Yeah. I'll keep it open for a little bit. Good, thank you. Yeah, I don't have enough sense to think up all those questions. <laughs> and don't forget, the uh, Midweek mid with Marks are posted on YouTube uh, the following Monday, so that's a good way to review. Yeah. It was a wonderful session, as usual. Well, thank you so much. It was a lot of fun.
Oh, yeah. somebody, yeah. somebody asked me if I ever give, give, give a presentation on hydrangea. I actually did early, yeah. early on. So you can go to YouTube, our YouTube channel. And I should be saying, I watched some YouTube, I should always be saying, like us and subscribe. So you're always notified when you go to, if you go to YouTube to watch it. But if, if you do go to YouTube, there is one that is on nothing but hydrangeas, especially highlighting some of the more unusual and less well-known species of hydrangeas. Yeah, I think that was the second one I ever watched. Yeah, yeah. And since you said that, Mark, don't forget to click on the bell icon. Don't forget to click on the bell icon. That's right. <laughs> I get notifications. I am subscribed. I get notifications when the Arboretum uploads a new video and sometimes it surprises me I, and I watch I watch them all as long as they're not me <laughs> I don't watch but I watch the field, children's programs ones those are great Garden story time I love them all right well thank y'all all so much this is always a high point of my week and Really, really enjoy it. Don't forget, there are all these great programs, propagation, fall vegetable gardening, gardening in the south, fall color, uh, just, just all kinds of things. So join us. You get to hear people other than me. This is how do you see the hydrangea presentation? You go to, go to YouTube and look at the midweek with Mark. Yep. So on, on the bottom right side of every one of our web pages are all, are all of our social media icons. And all you need to do is look for the little YouTube icon. That'll be the play button. And if you click on that, that'll go to our playlists. And Mark's Midweek with Mark's, as of right now, are still in the miscellaneous. And I do want to create a Midweek with Mark uh, playlist. So we'll get that going soon. Fantastic. But I'm sure if you just search the internet, midweek with Mark, Hydrangea, Ralston Arboretum, it'll get you right there. And Catherine, Looks like Catherine, Catherine put Wall there. placed it there. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, what a good one, Mark. That was great. Yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. And always great to see familiar faces and familiar names, at least, for some people. And we'll see you all next week on Wednesday at 3 o'clock. That's right. Goodbye.